Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, our latest uh, behind the scenes talk uh, with a member of the board, uh, this time the ultimate member of the board, uh, Earl Shorman, who is the president um, uh, of the uh, board of directors. Um, and uh, it's been a long time Oxfordian, and so uh, look forward to his remarks about the issue and about his plans for the uh, rest uh, of his tenure. So, Earl, thanks for joining us. Well, um, thank you, Bob. Um, why don't you uh, start us off with a sense of how you got involved in uh, authorship issues? Well, it really goes back <laughs> almost 40 years. Uh, when I read a review of Charlton Ogburn's Mysterious William Shakespeare, I became quite intrigued. Mm -hmm. uh, having lived in Ashland, Oregon for uh, since 1974, so this is 10 years after I moved to that town, and having been uh, totally dedicated to the Oregon Shakespeare Festival for the wonderful productions they were putting on there, this really did pique uh, some very uh, cu great curiosity in me. And then, of course, the Frontline program that followed in 1989 that was based on Ogburn's book, uh, uh, produced by Al Austin, really turned a lot of heads. So by the early 90s, I was so much aware of it that I was buying some books. And then finally, around the year 2000, I began attending uh, conferences at first going up to Concordia University in Portland, where for almost 15 years, I attended the annual uh, De Beers Study Conference, later termed the Shakespeare Authorship Studies Conference, where I got to meet Dan Wright, the director there, and then Stephanie Hughes and Richard Rowe and Roger Strittmatter, and really all the people who are still continuing to be relevant uh, in so many ways with the Shakespeare Authorship question. So I, I really jumped right into the deep end of the pool fairly early on and then in 2003, I retired from my career in emergency medicine after 30 years. I pretty much done what I could do and began taking Shakespeare studies courses at the University in Ashland. And then within the first year, I was able to actually write my first paper on, on Hamlet. The library at the university there was fantastic. It has over 7,000 Shakespeare titles. And wow. so I was blessed by having the freedom to begin this exploration in a in a in an venue in a university and with a library that supported uh, deep research into a lot of the questions that would subsequently come up really over the last almost 20 years. So I'm curious for someone who went from being um, uh, a lover of, of Shakespeare uh, in the uh, for the traditional author um, and then slowly evolved into, um, I guess, first you become a skeptic and then you become a doubter and then you become an Oxfordian. What's that transition like? Well, the, the, the transformation to be an Oxfordian was almost instantaneous, Bob. You pick up Charlton's book and you begin reading it and it doesn't take long to figure out that he's really onto something very, very interesting, mysterious, as he says in his title, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, intriguing. And so, I mean, it's a tome. It took a long time to get through that book, but eventually, it's a big one. you know, the love of the work itself make me want to know what's behind the mask of the author. And when you had what I would call a religious experience, that kind of trans transformational experience within the theater where you do reach what Aristotle would say is, you know, the awe, fear and awe, whatever those magnificent big feelings are, uh, and you have it there, you want to know a little bit more about how that story got put together. And then you discover in your exploration, particularly as an Oxfordian, that it is deep and rich, far richer than most um, traditional scholars would, would would actually want to want to give the attribution. I mean, certainly most people acknowledge, most scholars acknowledge that the Shakespeare used upwards of two hundred different literary sources. But it's the exploration of those sources that's kind of intrigued me over the over the mm -hmm. period of time. I'm mostly interested in literary sources and narratives that uh, that he reinvents in that mimetic genius that he displays. So it's the Greek sources, the Roman sources that have piqued my curiosity primarily. Um, uh, okay, so that's uh, that's quite interesting. Um, now, um, can you describe your growing involvement with uh, the organization sure. um, and leading to this exalted position? <laughs> <laughs> One that you've abandoned yourself. <laughs> yeah. Hey, look, <laughs> I, you know, periodically you need that. to take a break. Okay. Uh, well, uh, 2003, I was recruited uh, to join the old Shakespeare Fellowship Board 
not because I had written anything or distinguished myself in any way as a learned Oxfordian, because I lived in Ashland, Oregon. Okay. I lived where the festival was and they had hoped uh, that we would have okay. uh, future conferences there. Well, in 2005, we had the first joint conference of the old Shakespeare Fellowship and Shakespeare Oxford Society. And then subsequently, just about every five years, we've come back to Ashland and we just completed our fourth program there. Plus, we've run some summer seminars at the Hannon Library. You have Roger Strittmatter and Michael Delahoyd have helped teach there. So it's been a hotbed of Oxfordian interest in education. And in 2015, when we had our conference, uh, uh, the British scholars that came, including Ross Barber and Kevin Gilberry, Julia Cleave, Eddie Jolly, uh, and uh, Alexander Waugh, they all gave presentations at the Lifelong Learning Program, where I teach and learn. And 140 local residents came out to hear the English scholars. So Ashland truly was. And so the recruitment was successful. Bringing me on board helped bring a lot of educational interest uh, in our region and uh, with the festival. And of course, the former executive director of the festival, Paul Nicholson, was uh, an Oxfordian. And he did sign the Declaration. Oh, is that right? We had, a, we had a signing of the Declaration of Reasonable Doubt. And he was one of the signatories here in Ashland, along with some other members of the Akin Company and oh, that's interesting. other theater arts directors in the north in the in the West Coast. So we've had a lot of fun in Ashland over the years. So that's how I got involved. Um, and then, of course, being a person of interest in terms of studies, it just drew me down and further into it. And I was uh, dedicated to going to every conference I could and reading every book I could. Sure. Uh, as you see, there's a, quite a collection behind me, mostly acquired in the last 20 years. I'm not telling you how many titles there are. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. So, um, uh, so you start serving on the board. Uh, at, certain, at some point, I guess you get term limited off. Am I correct on that? Well, in 2009, I was asked to be the president of the Old Shakespeare Fellowship, and I served in that role for three years from 2009 to 2012. And I take credit for having recruited Tom Renier to replace me as president. And when Tom came on and John Hamill was the president at that time of the Old Shakespeare Oxford Society, they quickly negotiated the reunion of the two organizations. And so mm. uh, I take small credit. For the for recruiting Tom, who turned out to be one of the greatest Oxfordians of our era in terms of yeah. the impact he had uh, on on the fellowship and on the legal analysis of uh, Shakespeare. I mean, what a mensch he was in so many ways. We miss him so dearly. It's hardly imaginable. It's been three years since he's since he left us. Um, okay, so you now uh, were uh, elected by a claim. Uh, and I was and I was the first one to say, this is a good guy. We got to get him yeah. uh, because otherwise I might still be president. Um, listen, listen, I owe I owe the fellowship for publishing my articles. I mean, if you're willing to oh. publish what I'm writing, <laughs> I just oh, sent a letter to the editor uh, <laughs> yesterday and immediately Gary Goldstein answered and said he's going to publish it in the coalition. I won't tell you what's it about it's on, on some new research. I'm working oh, cool. on it right now, but but it was a delight to be able to get a turnaround the one day. Now maybe my role as president doesn't get. <laughs> oh no, I, I I doubt that would happen. Uh, but I think it's such a wonderful organization. There's so many deeply uh, committed people involved in it yeah. that when I was asked by Bonner Cutting, who's very difficult to to deny to serve um it took me a day or so to think about it and believe me i'm very happy to have acknowledged uh, the nomination and to be serving now since september in the role because this is such a great year bob to be involved it's such a yep. wonderful time to be an oxfordian so many good things are coming forward this year so um you're going to be president for another six or eight months maybe longer i'm i'm not involved in that but um, wh where do you think things will be going in the next, um, uh, well, until the end of the year? Well, this is the 400th anniversary of the publication of the first folio. So there's going to be publications and educational uh, uh, dis discourses on the relevance of the first folio, and in particular, the raising the question of the attribution of the work through an analysis of, of the first folio. And in a response to what the Folger Shakespeare Library, the Birthplace Trust in England and other organizations are putting out in relation and celebration of that 400th anniversary. The Brief Chronicles edition that's forthcoming this spring 
Uh, the first folio, the Sh a Shakespearean Enigma uh, by editor Roger Strittmatter has about 20 different articles that relate to the publication and the history and the uh, textual analysis and images uh, in that first folio. And I think that's that's an exciting prospect for this coming year. The other thing that's happening this year, and uh, I believe many of our viewers are probably aware of the publication of Elizabeth Winkler's new deconstruction of the Stratfordian uh, uh, story with her book, Shakespeare Was a Woman and Other Heresies, you know, how doubting the Shakespeare attribution, you know, brings down the wrath of the academy. Uh, yes, so sir. really, we have a, a, an opportunity here, and this being published by Simon and Schuster, so it's going to have a major impact. And, and Elizabeth has agreed to be the keynote speaker huh. at our conference in November in uh, New Orleans. Everybody in, is invited. There's room for you all to come or to live stream the show. Yeah. The registration page is actually up on the website uh, as I'm speaking. So I think it's really exciting year in so many regards. Rima Greenhill is coming out with her book on Love's Labor's Lost. And uh, there are other endeavors being published here and in England. Uh, the De Beers Society has several publication projects going forward. Uh, the Shakespeare Illusions book that Alexander Wan, Roger, have co-authored. Looks like it's about to make it this year. Oh, is that right? That. They have uh, Great Oxford 2 and 3, and they just recently reissued their, their volume of Dating Shakespeare Play. So from the point of view of publications, uh, this year is just a phenomenal goldmine for people who are interested in the subject, there's an endless amount of cool reading that, that you're going to want to do. One of the things that interested me about uh, Rima Greenhill's book, and I and I met her in Ashland, um, is the uh, uh, the title of it uh, shows the internationalization of of Shakespeare, whoever he was. The title is Shakespeare, Elizabeth, and Ivan: The Role of English Russian Relations. In Love's Labor's Lost. Um, and here is, if, you, know, you can't see it the way the camera's set up. Um, uh, but I've, I've talked with her about it. She's going to come back and, and speak to a group here in, in Washington. Um, it sounds really exciting. And also, Elizabeth Wagaman um, has been doing astonishing research in the impact of um, French politics on the writing of the plays, which, of course, raises the eternal question, well, how did the guy from Stratford, who, as far as we know, didn't speak French and was not educated and never left the country, how did he know about the politics of, of going? <laughs> but I'm, I'm, just, um, I'm just fascinated by the way uh, contemporary researchers are digging into um, international aspects. Well, look, you would be pleased, Bob, to know that the committee, the conference committee is working toward creating a whole division of our conference in November on the French connections. And Elizabeth has already submitted a proposal to discuss some of the things that oh, she's terrific. analyzing. Frank Lawler, who recently translated the uh, Sulemas, the Shakespeare, you know, the Avella Lafranc's book, he'll be speaking on his translation project. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, I believe there'll be several other speakers uh, that are interested in and have been doing research on those French connections, but we do know that the French was not taught in the Stratford Grammar School. And then you look at Henry <laughs> five, yet yeah, five, you know, and you see long, long, long French passages of the conversation between the king and the princess. You know, it's like he knew French, and of course, um, Oxford had you know French edition of uh, Plutarch, Amiot's translation of Plutarch, and we know he wrote uh, fluently in, in French. So and was familiar with the French court, had met Henry. Yeah. Third knew the, da the Duke d'Alençon. You know he was he was very much uh, connected to that French that whole French experience. I'm happy to say that when I was in high school, I had to um, uh, enact um, uh, as best I could. Let me put it that way. Um, uh, the uh, the final uh, scene in Henry V um, in French uh, as it was written. And the uh, the princess was a um, a lovely uh, lovely student uh, named Zora, uh, whose father was an ambassador. It's a memory that stuck with me, um, uh, and and that part of the play is just so uh, charming and delightful. So, it's, uh, <laughs> well, I'll tell you about this summer. I get to play Bottom uh, during a, a informal production on a place called Star Island. 
I'm the guest speaker for a whole week at a seminar that'll be uh, in the first week in July. Um, and the final uh, celebration is going to be a scene from a scenario from uh, A Midsummer Night's Dream. Oh, that's and, great. I, I, that, that is a French connection because Bob's clearly an allegorical, mocking, satirical, allegorical representation of the Duke d'Alencon. Yeah. The proof of that is uh, originally del delivered to us by Eva Turner Clark a century ago, but uh, I've looked into that myself and it's an amazing. Uh, a sequence of, of scenes in which Baden is clearly identified with the Duke and Titania, of course, with Queen Elizabeth I. Right, right. It's fascinating to me the way that uh, um, when you dig into this stuff, it uh, it's, it all starts to fall in place. And the plays start making sense in a way that they had not um, uh, before. So, but let's go back to the uh, foundation um uh, or the fellowship um do you see any uh, dynamic changes in how things uh, are being done today compared to five years ago um uh, things you want to be aware of five years ago the uh our website did not have videos of our conference presentations they okay. only began i think about 2000 okay so five years ago we had a few now we have a hundred from our presentations during our yeah. conferences. So in terms of the website evolution and development, it's phenomenal. Plus all the printed texts of the previous issues of the Oxfordian, the Brief Chronicles, of the newsletters, they're all available. So what Jennifer Newton has done in terms of expanding the capacity and the and the content of, of the website is just phenomenal. And that largely has been what's gone on since the organizations reunited in 2014, 13, 14. So I, I think that there's, you know, if you stretch that time frame just a little bit farther, you could see there's been a magnificent change in a new website that was built and ongoing developments on, on that website. Uh, she, Jennifer and uh, Dor Dorothea Dickerman, one of the other trustees, working on search engine optimization to increase the number of hits we have. There's an interest out there. Alexander Waugh's videos from the DeVere Society just hit a million views. So Is there's no right? longer to have those videos. Wow. We're also working with film artist Phoebe Near. We mm -hmm. gave her, came up with a, a modest grant to support a few productions and she's putting together Three, two, two of them have already been posted on uh, on her YouTube channel, and they will be available through uh, our website. We'll have her page set up uh, that are very amusing, short videos on, on authorship questions. So she's very charming. She became kind of famous and has a following on TikTok and also puts on a DeVere ball every January in New York City. And apparently there's a lot of young people that are really interested in that. We yeah. Love that having Phoebe on our team this year as a you know, contract, uh, you know, uh, supported by our, our, our grant. Also, Shirley and Donovan has worked up a very fine new Shakespeare 101 production with Alex McNeil's presentation, and that'll be posted hopefully within the next few weeks on the website too. So we have videos that are really moving along in that direction. This year, we're also very fortunate, and I I, I walked into a, a, a perfect storm of a of, of good a benefit uh, with the lifelong member lifetime members uh, stepping up. And we have gotten now over twenty five, I think, lifetime members uh, of, and most of them have signed up in the last six months. So that's been a, a wonderful campaign to increase commitment and resources so that we can continue our, our work. Uh, we haven't issued any research grants, but that those are not gonna be due until later in the year. We're still gonna have the video contest as we've had in recent years uh, that will be announced. And uh, you know uh, that contest will run through the summer and early fall mm -hmm. into the conference. And then the conference itself uh, in New Orleans promises to be quite an extraordinary. We've, we, we've almost booked out the hotel already. Is so, that right? Yeah, I mean, it's really uh, uh, looking like a lot of people want to come and they sense that this is a critical year to get involved. And for those of you who can't come to New Orleans in November, the live stream would still be an outstanding means by yeah. which to keep up on what's going on and, and share in the excitement and the enthusiasm that we get when we go in person and and, and meet each other and, and, you know, hang out together for a few days. It's wonderful. We certainly had that experience in Ashland. I thought that Goodwill and the, the great uh, production of The Tempest we saw and all the actors coming afterwards to talk about it, it really lit the crowd up. So if you don't come to conferences, you're missing out on a little, a, a lot of the fun. I agree with that. I, I, I agree with that. I've, uh, 
I, I'm trying to think. I think Oakland was my first conference. Uh, no, Boston. Boston was my first conference. Um, and uh, uh, I, I really enjoy them. It's the only conference uh, uh, I go to now. Um, and I'm happy to continue doing so. Well, Bob, in a couple of years, you're going to get recruited to set up and help us promote, promote another conference in Washington, D.C. in your region. Oh, great, great. You're a hotbed of Oxfordian interest there. And oh, yeah. No, it you really there is. there in 2011, and two things that happened during that conference that were really exciting was we got to see an early release of the film Anonymous, Roland Emmerich's film, and a oh. viewing in a theater there. And we got to go to the Folger Shakespeare Library, and they put up an exhibit of Oxford's titles and, and, and land grants and all sorts of things that were his and a beautiful exhibit, you know, that was just remarkable. The, the Geneva Bible, Oxford's Italian Historia d'Italia was there. I mean, it was just, it was uh, chilling to see all these original Oxfordian texts. So that is another, you know, golden apple we can pluck again for those who <laughs> missed that opportunity. You are, you are mine. So you put, you just put yourself in line for one of these conferences in the next three or four years, Bob. You know that it's difficult. You open your mouth sometimes, and then boom, you know, you just just have to watch it. I'll be delighted to help. Um, when I was gainfully employed, uh, staging conferences was what I did. So uh, um, happy to happy to help. Um, how do we get younger people to know about Oxford um, and to become as enthusiastic as um, graybeards like we are uh, while they're still learning how to shave? Uh, well, you know, you've got to love Shakespeare first. And mm -hmm. so you're already, you have a pre-selection issue. I mean, there could be young people who are really interested in in, in history and in Renaissance history that are not dedicated to doing Shakespeare the way we are. But I think you're, you you have to kind of target the people who are in the theater arts programs, in the English studies programs, if you're looking to, to get young people involved more. Don Rubin, of course, had his course at uh, at uh, in Toronto uh, when he was still teaching before he retired. Uh, I know that Michael Delahoyd in, in uh, Washington State University does introduce the Oxford question uh, in his uh, discourses on Shakespeare. He's an extremely popular teacher. So you have to find teachers who are willing to reach out almost personally in person to young people to, to actually get that moving. We need more teachers of the officer question. I'm a defender of teaching this to the lifelong learning people. They are the people who have a cultivated interest in Shakespeare. They have the resources to buy books and go to plays. Uh, and they have a lifetime of experience to try to look uh, skeptically in, with interest at something as challenging and fascinating and as absorbing as the authorship question can be to those of us who have done the, the reading, of course. Uh, I am. Um, so I, uh, I, I, I like the idea of, of hitting all age groups, but converting young people will, will mean having to convert their teachers and the re outreach to the uh, that we've done in the past to, to uh, secondary school teachers through the national NCTE program in Baltimore a few years ago, we might be able to get back into those kinds of things. Live streaming programs and educational content put up through live streaming or Zoom will also open up doors, I think, in the future. We have to be kind of patient. This is a 400-year-old challenge and problem. Yeah. We've only really yeah. been on, on the hot trail for just a century now. And for you my know, 20 years of involvement, directly involvement, um, I feel like I'm still, you know, like a sophomore at university. I haven't quite gotten to graduate school yet. I, I really want to learn more about this. And so this is one way that older people can keep their hearts and minds more alive uh, and uh, stimulate uh, interest in collegiality and, and circles that are outside the mainstream. That's yeah. a feeling fe feature to Americans, I think. We, we're we born to love the, the rebels. You know, we have a cause. Mm -hmm. I, um, uh, just to ratify something you said, um, I was invited to go talk to uh, people attending a Shakespeare festival. It was a three or four day festival in um, Delaware. Nice. Um, this was last year. And um, so I drove up there and uh, had my uh, little, you know, uh, a USB stick and I was going to plug it in. And, and there were technical problems. So I both talked and used the... Uh, uh, the stick. But the interesting thing to me was 
that I was given, I've been given a strict time limit. And I'm going to hypothetically four to five thirty, because of the um, technical problem. Um, I ha- had only gotten about a third of the way through my talk by five thirty. No, nobody left. I mean, somebody pointed out, okay, if you need to leave, you can leave. Not a single person left the room. And I, and at the end, we got the technical problems were, were, and then they wanted to ask questions. So I think if we can get this stuff in front of people, yeah. um, it also seems to me, I may be editorializing here, but um, Shakespeare is being taught less and less uh, it, at the sub-college level. In fact, even in college, uh, it's being uh, taught less and less. And that's something that we can't do anything about because that's a national issue. Um, but I think we can uh, balance it uh, or compensate for it with what we put up on the website and the programs we do, um, uh, et cetera. But my my college, UCLA, I mean, when I was a student at UCLA, um, I took two Shakespeare classes. And I, I think as a transfer student, it was one I couldn't take. I don't think they offer those classes anymore. They work Shakespeare into sort of, you know, um, uh, Elizabethan or medieval literature. Um, and uh, so it's tough. We have to work on that. Um, well, people are are intimidated sometimes by the language and the play on project that was originally developed at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival going back 2000. 17, 18, and it's now its own independent, has translated those those plays into slightly simpler language. And these are good playwrights who are doing this. Yeah. So there's there's a cultural phenomenon in which we want to make these things somehow more understandable, but that means losing the original language, the original poetry, the original complexities on some level. So you, it takes someone who's passionately involved and, and loves the theater, I think, and of course, I'm not saying the poems aren't compelling, but it's interesting that the collected works of Shakespeare usually didn't include the sonnets and the long lyrical poems, the Venus yeah, and, yeah. and Lucrece, until after Edmund Malone got involved in it and said, oh, we, these need to be back in there. And that might have been because of the discomfort they felt over the homoeroticism that's in those sonnets, those painful sonnets. So uh, I think that there's a variety of ways in which people can be brought in uh, to an interest in our compelling uh, narrative. It's our own passion that 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 gets people. It, it, one person like myself, I've I've recruited I don't know how many locals to open up their minds to it and begin doing yeah. it. And once they get into it, they usually come back year after year after year. I today just now put together the syllabus for a uh, program, a teaching, a uh, lifelong learning program. I've got about 25 people coming to my classes starting next Tuesday. Um, and it's just a four week class, and that's called Shakespeare's Books. We'll be talking about the first folio. We'll go oh, to the nice. library and, and, and we'll look at the second and, and, and fourth folios, Shakespeare folios and the other folios. Oh, and we'll look at the Holland's heads that they've got there and the Plutarchs, North Plutarch and the, the Hall's Chronicles and the other Shakespeare sources. And I will demonstrate to the class how incredibly literate Shakespeare was and how he relied on these massive volumes to put together the narratives he put into the history plays and into the you know comedies and tragedies. So it would be, it would, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, no. And so, and then I'll be talking about Stephanie Hughes's book, Shakespeare's Education, and point out how incredible uh, it is that he had this wide ranging reading and that we have no evidence of a, of a literary paper trail attached yeah. to Shakespeare. There was no books in his will or any associations with the literary, uh, uh, you know, detritus somewhere uh, in his history, personal history in, in Stratford. Um, and then the other thing I'm going to share with them is some of my own research and my own original research that was done mostly in, at the library there. So I hope to make it real in the sense that it's worthy of pursuing these things. Sometimes you make discoveries that actually get you behind the author's mask and you see things that maybe others haven't appreciated. For so years. can you take what you're putting together for um, uh, for this course in Ashland? Can you nationalize it? Can you make it available to um people like me in different parts of the country 
Well, I think that certainly uh, PowerPoint presentations uh, on this are, are can be created, sure. Uh, they, we have a number of them already, you know, based on yeah. the things that are already in the in the. Well, I've got mine. I mean, the one yeah. that. But know, tying it all together in, yeah. in, a, in a in a coherent way, sure, Bob. That that could probably be done. But you got to find an audience that wants to be challenged this way. Now, mm -hmm. I'm not. I don't have the credentials of a Shakespeare scholar. I, I don't have the credentials of a classic scholar. I don't read Latin or Greek other than medical Latin. I had to learn, you know, thousands of Latin terms to, in med school, but. Um, doesn't mean I can't learn from translations. It doesn't mean that I can't uh, analyze as a theater critic might uh, and put together things that are uh, credible, even though I don't have that credential. I have published in some mainstream uh, publications. Uh, one of my articles on in, uh, Much Ado About Nothing was actually published in Gale's uh, collection of essays in 2012. Uh, mm -hmm. so I'm rather proud of that, that it was accepted there. I saved my 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 at attribution to Earl of Oxford to the last paragraph. And I said, well, given the sources, uh, and many of them had already dedicated works to Oxford that were sources for, for uh, uh, a bunch of do about nothing. I said, it is the most Oxfordian, perhaps, of all the comedies. And they let that go through. They, they actually included that. But that was the only mention of Oxford in the entire... Well, Work. That's good. All right. Final thought as president of the Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship. Um, no restrictions. We need your participation. We need your donations. We need memberships. Talk to your friends. We do love to be involved in this and we want to spread that love to others. And those kinds of activities help us out. We're a completely volunteer organization of about 500 people, a handful of writers and activists kind of leading the charge, totally committed, doing this pretty much on their own dime. I uh, don't think anybody's making a great right. profit off of this. So if you want to get involved in a nonprofit that has a big, big, uh, you know, uh, mission uh, and has huge amounts of resistance to overcome and a great delight that you can take because you might be part of something that is historical in terms of the reattribution of the works uh, to Edward de Vere, the Earl of Oxford, as the author of the Shakespeare canon. Come along and join us. And if you're interested in, in volunteering, you can write to me at info at shakespeareoxfordfellowship.org. And I'll be glad to have a conversation with you about what can be done to help you get more involved. We're always looking for extra help. Couldn't have said it better myself. So, that's great. Thanks, Earl. I really appreciate you taking the time. It's a pleasure, Bob. And thank you for sharing uh, all the people that you've been interviewing on this series. It's a uh, it's a real uh, uh, eye opening in some regards. Yeah. Thanks from, from your interviews about other folks yeah. that I didn't know before. So keep it up, my friend. Thanks a lot. Take care. Okay, bye now. Bye-bye.